Thank you. All right. Uh, yes, I do travel a lot. Tools like TripIt are great little tools for, for managing itineraries and your travel schedule. They're also really bad for helping you understand just how much you do travel. If you have a look up there, I've travelled over 2 million kilometres in the last, uh, it's about nine years, uh, and it's a staggering number of nights to be away from your family. That's, you know, travel's great when you're with your family and you're holidaying, uh, not so good if it's all work travel. But on the upside, I've had the opportunity to work with a wide variety of organisations and customers. Um, and I've seen, you know, just a lot of different things, a lot of things that work, a lot of inspirational ideas, and a lot of things that um, you can learn from. All right. Uh, I'm a member of a small team. I'm a, a DevOps architect, not a title I'm really in love with. Um, but there are five of us around the world uh, at the moment. And that's, uh, I guess, one of the reasons for a lot of the travel that I do. So I want to share with you some of our own journeys. Um, I'll focus specifically on the Azure DevOps team and what our transformations look like. So I do work with the Azure DevOps team. Many of you will probably still know it by its previous acronym, VSTS. So we did change that name. Name changes are great. Excellent. So we've got this name for at least the next six weeks, um, hopefully just a wee little bit longer. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful story that I'll refuse to discuss any further. Um, all right. So Microsoft was born in 1975. That predated a lot of the internet. A lot of our competitors today were born in the era of the cloud. They, they, they learnt by taking the first step and then just iterating. We've been around a lot longer than that. Um, and while we started, like all good companies, nice and small, we developed when you know, waterfall was the flavour of the day. Um, and for us, we needed to change a lot in order to stay relevant today. So do we get DevOps? Well, I wanted to share some numbers with you, numbers that were just staggering. This is about uh, 93,000 engineers within Microsoft. So how, how do we go with deployments? We do about 78,000 deployments every single day. That's a huge number. I just I think, wow. We have 2 million Git commits happening every month, 4.4 million builds per month. And then, again, one of my favourites here, we execute half a billion tests every single day. OK? Um, you know, some great numbers. And that underlines for us just how much of a shift we've undergone. And it's a journey. We're not there. But, you know, it's a never-ending journey. Don't, don't ever go to your project manager and say, I want a funding approval for a project that hasn't got an end date. Don't ever do that. That's not, not, not quite what I mean. Some of the earlier speakers in the conference have talked about the State of DevOps report. Um, I love the 2018 version. I love that it doesn't talk about the difference between people, organisations doing DevOps and not doing DevOps, but rather it focuses on what it takes to be an elite performer in the DevOps space. Okay? Others have talked about that, and I'm hoping this audience is well aware of that report. I want to focus on something, the, the conspiracy of silence. What about your existing business, your existing code? And you know, that's, that's what I want to talk a little bit more about. Who's ever used Team Foundation Server? TFS. <laughs> Excellent. Great. So who's that, who, whoever installed TFS 2005, the first version? Excellent. I got so much income as a consultant fixing those things. <laughs> um, it, it was marvellous. It was excellent. So TFS 2010, in this particular example, it's a boxed product. That's excellent from a DevOps perspective, because you don't get the phone calls. You, they, they buy the box, they go and install it, and when their server breaks, they ring themselves. It's excellent. We get to have a good night's sleep. Um, but at the time of TFS, our customers were coming to us and saying, how does your tool help us be agile? And our answer was, well, I don't know. You know, we were too busy striving to achieve peak technical debt using waterfall. Uh, fortunately, we've got over that. So how do we take this large on-premise product and move it to a global scale cloud service? Well, we had some options. Firstly, you know, we needed to maintain compatibility between the existing on-premises product and the cloud-hosted offering. We had a choice. We could re-architect it. You know, Greenfield, go 
re-architect the whole thing, and then bring it up to the cloud. And our, our developers are going, yes, 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 Greenfield, definitely the way to go. The other option is to simply move it up to the cloud and re-architect and deal with the challenges as they arrive. And that's what we chose to do. We actually chose to pick up the existing code base, make kind of the, the bare minimum changes to it. And for us, that was changing how we dealt with identity. You know, we couldn't assume on-prem AD anymore. Now it was about credentials in the cloud. So we changed that and up it went. Now there were some constraints there. TFS was single tenant. Uh, there was guaranteed downtime whenever you wanted to update or service the instance. No telemetry, no deployment cadence. There were some big issues there. So we, we took our first step, our first sprint, and that was back in 2010. Okay? Um, we've just, we're currently in sprint 143. So it's been, you know, that puts an age on the journey for you. There were some interesting challenges in the approach that we took. Firstly, it wasn't multi-tenant, so that meant every customer that signed up, we gave them a SQL Azure database. We got to about 11,000 SQL Azure databases and broke stuff, which is always good. We actually were, were experts at breaking stuff and the SQL Azure guys really didn't like us. Um, now this was not affordable. Like many of you, our team gets an Azure bill. So going and creating a database for every single customer that was just not sustainable for us whatsoever. The other thing was, um, for the, probably the first maybe nine months of the service, whenever we wanted to do a an update or a release, we set up a maintenance window. How frustrating are those things? We still see them today. Um, not with our service so much, but you know, every time, and I'm sure you've all had the experience, where you've gone online to do something, often on a weekend, and you had that dreadful, oh, we're down for maintenance at the moment. Not, not good. Well, we did that for about nine months. Um, you know, that's, that's just not sustainable. So what could possibly go wrong? At a high-profile event, the Connect Conference, we were launching the service. We've used feature flags, feature toggles. These were great. And just prior to the launch, uh, during the Connect Conference, we flipped all those switches on. Great idea, right? <laughs> Turns out, no. It started two weeks of sheer living hell for the team. That was horrible, but a great learning experience for us. Okay. Um, so individually, feature flags were excellent. Nowadays, one of the lessons learned is before any announcement, particularly at a large T1 conference, those feature flags are turned on at least 24 hours in advance. There's a tip. If there's a big Microsoft conference about a day before, go and have a look in your account. I didn't tell you that. I'm going to focus on four of the lessons that we've learned, or four things that just resonated for me. One of the first things is customer focused. Saying you're customer focused, well, that's easy. The people that made my coffee this morning were customer focused, and they did a great job, by the way, love it. Um, so what does that mean to us? Well, we listen to our customers. Who's, who's ever said a bad word about TFS or Visual Studio? Excellent, good. Who's gone to user voice and shared that with us? Thank you. For the rest of you, visualstudio.uservoice.com. So that's a really important thing. Prior to joining Microsoft as a Microsoft MVP, I was in some of the planning sessions where we, we actually saw that user voice feedback and I witnessed that feedback being used in our planning sessions. One of our senior leadership talk about how they look on user voice for feedback before checking their email in the morning. A couple of the other Microsofties in the room will appreciate, as a very email-focused organization, doing something before email in the morning, that's unheard of. So we really listen there. I should also point out, and I chose an example here, that, that took two years. Just because you put it on user voice doesn't mean it's a guaranteed, you know, something you're going to get. The one up there was about two years before that particular feedback resulted in a change to the product. But that's okay, we didn't lose sight of that feedback even over those, those longer tails. We're active on Stack Overflow. For our largest customers, we embed PG champions, product group champions. They go out and they spend time with these customers. They walk the halls, chat to people. Not formal meetings necessarily, but just, hey, you're using our tool, what do you think? And just, you know, how can I show you something? You know, tell me what the experience is like. 
We, inside the product, give people the opportunity to report a problem or to suggest a feature or, you know, a change. So, you know, it'd be great if there was one single area to get that feedback, but you have to listen in all the channels that your customers are likely to use. I just want to recap the definition of DevOps that we tend to resonate with. If you get a room of 20 people, there are 20 different definitions of DevOps. That's easy. This one came from Donovan Brown, and it's the one that sort of works best for us. DevOps is the union of people, process, and tools to enable the continuous delivery of value to our customers. Okay? That's, that's what we really strive for. We have a build, measure, learn culture. So we basically start with the hypothesis. We believe that this, you know, Customer wants this particular fe feature for these reasons. We design an experiment to prove or disprove that, and then we learn from that experiment. Okay? And we really, really do this. Okay? So who's ever used team rooms in TFS? Okay, just a few hands. That doesn't surprise me. This is an example of listening to customers where our customer said, we need enterprise social. Okay? Within the tool, we need some sort of social mechanism for our development teams to communicate and talk. And we said, oh, look, we've already got Skype, Skype for Business, we've got Yammer, we've got... Um, the, the, the list was long. And they went, no, 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 no. We want something different. Okay, we listened. We created the experiment. And the experiment meant that we created team rooms and we put it into the product. Okay, good, that's listening. We added telemetry in there so that we could look at the usage of the tool. And what do you think we found? No one used it. Well, not true. People went, oh, look at this, and then they stopped using it. Okay? So we kept it in the, the product for probably three releases, and then we basically, from that learning, thought, well, let's grab those engineers and move them into somewhere else. We turned the lights off on that particular area, and no one cared because no one used it, so that was, that was great. It was a great learning experience for us. Our definition of done, I really, really liked this part. It's not a complete definition of done, trust me, but Part of our DOD states that the feature is live in production, collecting telemetry that examines the hypothesis which motivated the deployment. Just because it's, we've finished the code, just because it's been deployed, that's not done. We can't claim done. That feature has got to be educating us. It's got to be giving us learnings about how our customers are using that feature. And only then can we claim you know, that we're done there. Something else that we changed along the way as part of our journey, I want to talk about team autonomy and enterprise alignment just briefly. For anyone that's read Dan Pink's book called Drive, who's read that book? Great book. There's a great uh, example in there. They talk about two groups of people going after the same business opportunity. Group A has a great business plan established in the market. They're well-funded, hiring the best people, and then Group B is working for free. It's in their spare time, and it's because they want to. You know, tra traditional business logic tells us you're going to back Group A every time, but if that was the example here, it'd be a really lousy example, wouldn't it? So who are these two groups? Group A is, in, is Encarta. Group B is Wikipedia. Now, for those of you that don't know what Encarta is, look it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> and, and I love this. Microsoft Encarta was... Oh, you're nasty. I put the red underline there, by the way. Um, and what he talked about was what motivates people. That's the byline. This is an economist, this author. And he talks about what people, you know, in terms of motivating people, you know, the carrot, the stick, the old, the old approach. But what people really want is autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And if you can give those things to your team, you are much more likely to have highly, you know, successful, engaged, enthusiastic teams. How that applies to DevOps for us, in the area of planning and practices, we give a lot more autonomy to our teams. Within Azure DevOps, that's about 800 engineers, about 35 to 40 feature teams, that varies. You know, we gave them all agile training, and then some of those, you know, those the teams tried uh, pair programming. For some teams it worked and they continued to do that. Other teams tried it, didn't like it, that's okay. They were able to choose the practices that worked for them. 
we give them some autonomy over planning. So within the sprint and then the three sprint horizon, the teams can look after that themselves. Above that, it's more about alignment. Things like taxonomy. We need a standard language and terminology across that number of engineers. The cadence. It would have been nice to say, hey, you teams, you go and choose two week, three week, four week sprints, whatever. That didn't work. So we now all march to the same cadence. So when we're talking across our teams and we talk about Sprint 143, all those engineers know exactly what Sprint 143 is. It's the current Sprint in this case. Okay, so that was important for us. Looking at the org chart uh, within our area probably oh, about five, seven years ago, we had these roles, very, very common roles, aren't they? So we had program management, we had development, testing, and we had the challenges associated with those silos, the inefficiencies, the blame game happening there. Now, I will point out something. We were almost uniquely able to do this next thing when we introduced combined engineering. I'll give you that insight. Our testers, the roles were SDEs, SDETs, you know, software development engineers in testing. So our testers were first and foremost people with coding skills. That's important. So when we introduced combined engineering, we got rid of the titles developer and tester. They were just engineers. So they were responsible for writing the code and the tests. Now that, that wasn't, you know, the, the, the animation was so much smoother than the experience, <laughs> I've got to say. Okay. You know, DevOps is a, you know, I, I guess I work for a, t a tools team, but the, the, the people side of this, the culture, so it took a while, it took probably at least six weeks before we stopped looking and going tester, developer. Okay, took quite a bit longer for us to, um, to, to find some of those testers that just didn't make the change. Some of the testers looked to other opportunities within the organisation and unfortunately some of the testers just didn't find a spot they were happy with and we actually lost some staff at that point. Um, that's the reality of it. It wasn't just perfect sailing, not at all. We gave ops you know, a seat at the table, but we weren't done. We then moved forward and we created a feature team and we brought representatives of all of those together. And then something that I thought was just marvellous, we gave them direct access to the customer. I was working with a customer in Bloomington, Minnesota, uh, probably six weeks ago, okay? Um, that's a travel lesson that I learned as well. You think DevOps is hard? Try explaining to your wife when you're you know, you're working next to the largest shopping centre in America, that you have a baggage limit. That's much, much harder. So these guys were using App Centre and they were having a few challenges. So I was able to get on the phone, get to one of the PMs on the App Centre product team. He got on a call that afternoon with two of the engineers from the team and spoke directly to the customer. And the customer felt so, so special, so empowered because they're talking to the people that are writing the tool. That's a huge win for the customer. It, you know, not all the answers were what the customer wanted to hear at the time. But the other win was from the, you know, the, the, the product team. They got to speak to the people that are using the fruits of their labour every single day. You know, direct speaking to your customers was, was just wonderful. So that was another big win. We keep these feature teams. We, you know, my first time to, to Redmond, to the Redmond campus, I walked in and... I walked up uh, one of the buildings and there was all this dark wood grain and everyone had their own little offices and for me it was like just, oh, it was, it was dark. So we went through the experience, we tried open plan. I'm trying to remember the name of the company that, that was credited with open plan. Uh, they gave up on open plan after about six years. Uh, so open plan didn't quite work. So we've come up with a hybrid that works for us. This is a team room, not the, the ill-fated product feature, but a team room where we co-locate everyone working within that team. Every person you can stand up and see is working on solving the same business problem that you are. The individual roles, you could have an engineer here, you could have one of the DRIs, a designated responsible individual. So if there is an LSI, a life site incident, to do with, uh, say, the Azure boards, one person here is going to get that call. And that brings the, 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 the challenge to the people that write it. And that's, that's not seen as a burden to them, but rather if, if there's a problem with something you're putting your blood, sweat and tears into, if there's a problem with it, you come and speak to me because I'm the person that's best able, my team is best able to fix that. And I'm really invested in getting that fixed. So that worked out well. The size there's about 10 to 12 people. We try and keep them together for about 12 to 18 months. 
they own the feature, they own it in production, they own the deployment of that feature and they choose when that feature goes forward. I'm going to ask you a question. So, as, we, as humans, we, we need challenges. We need a change of scene from time to time. Okay? For me, it seems there's a two-year resonance. After two years, I, I get bored and I want to do something else. So, question, how many of you have left a job because you were bored and there were no challenges, no other opportunities inside the company, you've gone somewhere else? How many people have done that? Most of us. Okay? So, we've got this thing, it's the stick, we call it the sticky note exercise. Some of you may have heard of it as self-forming teams. And this is fantastic. So about every 12 to 18 months, we get the teams together. It's almost like the, the NFL draft. And the PMs sort of say, hey, come and work for my team. We're going to do this, this, and this. And we've got a popcorn machine. They have a bit of fun too. And people go in there and they put up their, their first, second, and third preferences. So I can say, look, you know, I've been doing this Azure boards for a little while. I want to move across and do some work with um, artifacts or I want to expand my horizons and skills into this other area. So they can go and vote to join a different team. They're not guaranteed to get it, which is why you have a first, second and third preference. But what's really amazing about it is it means that if you are looking to change, get another challenge, you can do so within the company. And hopefully, we're giving people more challenges within the org so that they don't have to go looking outside and take a lot of that organisational knowledge and experience with them. We find that about 20% of people do take the opportunity to change. And what's really great about this, this is driven by the person. Remember those motivators? Autonomy. You choose if you want to move to another team. Okay? Now, moving 20% of people, it's, that's just how it's worked out. That means that we're, we're getting that microculture of those teams and we're spreading it across the other teams. So that's proven to be a really you know, successful thing for us. In terms of true, complete transparency, there are instances where leadership have gone and said, you know, hey, Vlad, we really can't afford to have you leave this team right now. So if you work with us for the next 12 months, we're going to do this, this and this, and at the end of that, we'll guarantee you your first preference on whichever other team you want to move to. Okay, so you know, sometimes that, that has to happen. Okay, I'm not here to sort of sell you on the idea, but share the experience, it's both good and bad. In terms of shift left on quality, this was a big one for us. Okay, so around 2010, the arrival of cloud services, there was a faster cadence. You know, traditionally we had our, our beta one, beta two, release candidate, release candidate two, we had these big long periods of time to get customer feedback. We couldn't always act on that feedback because of the, the model we had, um, but we lost that. We also had now microservices being deployed independently. So testing was a real challenge. So how do we address it? Well, traditional waterfall testing, but go faster. <laughs> Push for faster automation, more automation, more of those, um, what are they, the functional automated tests, that's gonna win. Go and do those for us. And then test selection became you know, our survival. So we could choose subsets of tests to run it. And in fact, we then invent, we, we invented these terms. We had NARS, nightly automated uh, runs. And our NARS were taking 22 hours. And that was good because it was still night somewhere in the planet. Okay. <laughs> we then had our FARS. These were our full automated runs. They were taking about two days. So great news, engineer. You make a change and we'll tell you how it went in about two days. Not going to work. The next thing is, what do you know about these automated functional tests? Other than they're the most expensive to write, the slowest to run, and the least reliable. And that's what we were relying on. Okay? So what had happened is we'd get 70% pass rate, and we'd go, yes, ship it! <laughs> yep, think about that for a second. <laughs> and, and it's kind of serious. We had a quality signal we couldn't trust, not because these failed tests were an indicator of bugs in the product, maybe they were, but these were flaky tests. Tests were breaking all over the time, all over the place, and, and because of the, the structures and the silos we had, no one really owned them. Oh, that's, that's a flaky test, ignore it. That's another flaky test, ignore it. Let's get a sign made up, this is even better. Flaky test, okay? So, a quality signal you couldn't trust, how absurd. So, we published this vision, it was as recent as February 2015, and it was a typical invert the test pyramid or shift left as we prefer to call it now. 
We were in that place that you see over here on the, the bad left part of it, where the majority of our testing, our QA, was all these, these TRA tests. That was a, another term. You're about to speak the Microsoft lingo after this. Um, all of our tests were these nasty tests. So we came up with a new vernacular that made more sense, not about how long they took to run, but we came up with this L0, L1, 2s and 3s. And these talked about the dependencies, the external dependencies on the type of tests. L0 were the just simple in-memory unit tests. These are the best ones, so we strive for L0. If you can test something as an L0, it has to be an L0. Okay, so, you know, more and more, we put a lot of energy and effort into L0s. So we banned and outlawed the tra tests. Our L1s could then have dependencies like SQL. We moved into our functional tests, L2s and 3s. Functional tests could work against a testable deployment, and L3s could work against production. We could run tests there. Okay, so we came up with that taxonomy. And then we started. We started with 27,000 of these tra tests. I'd hate to try and put a dollar amount on what it costs to you know, develop those over the years, but we had these 27,000 tra tests and we're not going to write any more. You must write L0 tests. And it took probably about three sprints and the developers went, wow, we can actually check something in and get an answer back before two days. This is exciting. It took a bit of practice. So we, as, you, as you see there, and each of these are the three-week sprints, so this timeline is going to be about two and a half to three years you're about to see. So we worked our way down, we worked our way down, we got to, I think it was around about sprint 110, and you might see, probably just here, see the little nasty tra tests go up again? Just a little bit. It's like, hang on, did we suddenly start writing the nasty tests? No. We actually found about 500 tests we didn't know we had. It's like, <laughs> whoops. So we threw those back into the mix, and those, you know, those then had to be replaced. So we worked our way along, and by sprint 136, we're now running something like 20, uh, sorry, uh, 74,000 of these L0 tests. Okay? Guys, that's two and a half years. That does not happen overnight, not even close. Okay? Let's have a look at what that looks like today. So what you're looking at here, this is Azure DevOps. This is live. Okay? <laughs> and I have rights and permissions. And what you see is these are our pull requests. These are literally real-life pull requests from the last 12 hours or so. If, we go and, if, if one of our engineers wants to commit uh, a change into master, they submit a pull request. And as part of that pull request, if we go and have a look at it, you know, lots of things happen. Over here, we see the build succeeded. What do we do in terms of the testing? So here's this particular pull request. Checking quickly that there's nothing there that shouldn't be. And I click on tests. What we expect to see here is probably close to 83,000 tests are executed on every single pull request. And we do this hundreds of times a day. Okay, so what's the numbers now? So we're up there around 83,000, eight, nearly 84,000 roundup uh, of these L0 tests. That takes about seven minutes to run. So that's a huge change from the, you know, these FAR tests that were taking two days. So every time we try and commit something to master, this happens. And there's things like we do cred scan, bin scan, we do so much other security scanning across that pipeline as well, so that by the time a change gets into master, we have a really high degree of confidence and we try and keep master as always shippable. Our slower tests, the L2s and the L3s, if we pop over to a dashboard, okay, that's visibility of our test runs for those functional tests. Just let that refresh in real time, hopefully. I think I can, I think I can, great. These are our L2s and L3s. They take longer to run uh, because of their dependencies and where they need to execute. But guys, that's real, that's a live site. What you're seeing there is through shifting left, putting quality into the pipeline, by putting it into our pull request workflow, we do stay green a lot more often. We look at that every day, all day, through, through those builds, and you'll see there that we don't have very many consecutive fails at all. Okay, they exist, and they kind of have to exist. That's why we have these tests, to find any challenges or issues. Okay, so that was a big lesson for us. We also use safe deployment in controlling our exposure. So how do we deploy? 
Well, this is, I'd like to think of this as sort of DevOps 101 stuff. We use the same t tools to deploy into production that we use to deploy in our dev and test environments. We really focus on that green light. We have zero downtime deployments, and we have to. We're a global service. We actually have, we, we cover seven continents. You heard right, we have 11 users in Antarctica. Okay, that's really cool. Okay, and we deploy during work hours. That was a, a big improvement. We use feature flags, feature toggles, that's great. Okay, um, we can change configuration on those feature flags using custom made PowerShell scripts, or we can use a web UI. We can turn these things on for individual people, for groups, for scale units. You know, we've got a lot of control over that. When we deploy, we deploy to these rings. We deploy to ring zero first. Ring zero, these are our most fault uh, or risk tolerant customers. That's ourselves, okay? So you are deploying to MS Eng, Microsoft Engineering. These are also the people that sort of work just across the, the way there that can come in and kick you in the pants if you don't make a mistake. But for them, it's production. So we test in production. So we go to ring zero. We then go to ring one. Ring one's, uh, there's a few key things here. So Ring 1 at the moment is a comparatively smaller data center. It's actually today, it's in Brazil. That's about one to one and a half million um, accounts. And the reason we use Brazil is it still gives us the US time, time zone. So it means that if there's any challenges or issues, most of the engineers we need are at work already. It helps us test the, the, the breadth of the product. So within our team, primarily now we use Git for our version control, absolutely. But a lot of our enterprise customers use centralized version control, TFVC. So we need to be able to test those kinds of things that we don't use heavily ourselves. So that's fantastic when we go out to ring one, they can test the full breadth of the product. And if everything's good and okay there, we can move on to ring two, our public accounts, medium to large data centers now. Ring three, we move out to some of our large internal accounts, so Azure, Windows and so forth. And then we introduce some of the first European data centers. And then if everything's going okay, we go out to ring four and ring five. That's basically everyone else. So we limit the blast radius. If there's a problem or an issue, we want to find it earlier. So much of the themes we've heard, uh, not just in some of the presentations in this conference so far, but in the field, it's about faster, faster, faster. Well, we, we went that way. We achieved fast. If there's a priority one hotfix that's got to go out, we can get it around the globe in minutes. But we soon learnt that too fast and you trip over yourself. So now we choose to take about a week to do everything you see up there. Okay? By choice and by design. Okay? It's no good. Release, 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 and then suddenly you're in ring you know, four and the guys in ring zero start telling you about the problems. You know, now it's too late. We break our deployments down into the binaries. Okay? So we send the binaries out first because binaries can work with the old database as well as the new database. So the binaries go out, and if everything's okay, then we will service the database, because after we service the database, there is no rollback. Okay, so that's one of the characteristics there. In showing you what that actually looks like in the product, this is, yeah, we use Azure pipelines to deploy Azure DevOps. The tool deploys itself. Isn't that wonderful? So we have ring zero where we deploy to ourselves. I realize that's probably too small for many of you to see. But here's our rings as we move from left to right. Okay, we, we talk about scale units. We deploy out to those various rings. If I go up and have a look at some of the variables, what you can see there is, I, I thought was interesting, additional delay in minutes. Let me repeat, at a time when we're talking about faster, 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 what you're seeing up there is additional delay. These are deliberate pauses to give any bugs or issues time to manifest themselves so that we can do something about it. Feature flags are also interesting. If I go over and click on my user avatar there and go down to preview features, we let customers opt in themselves to some of these feature flags. If we've got risk tolerant customers that are excited to have a look at the new things, they can go and turn them on themselves. Okay, or if they don't like it, they can turn it off. So basically, you know, having these features sitting there um, for people to gradually adopt is great for us because you know, we will have a lot of customers that'll turn that on and that means we start getting feedback much, much sooner. Okay, we love those nice small feedback loops. Okay, so 
the journey has its up and down, you know, it's had its ups and downs. It hasn't been smooth sailing, not by a long shot, but it also hasn't been absolutely terrible. I've got one final slide that I want to show you, and this is basically a measure of the, the value we're delivering our customers. As we have been on this seven, nearly eight year journey now, in terms of the features, the value we deliver our customers, in 2016, we delivered more value than the entire four years preceding that. It wasn't because we employed more staff. No, we didn't. It wasn't because we changed the definition of a feature. It was the results of our transformation. What happens when we removed a lot of those taxes that we were placing on our teams unnecessarily? Have a look there. In 2017, we achieved 364 features, value to our customer there. Okay, that's, that's just extraordinary. This year, we're not going to go anywhere near that. We've had external uh, things like GDPR, which has been a huge tax imposed on many organisations. We've also had uh, the rebranding. It, it wasn't just a rebranding. It's a whole change to the model, uh, the new verticals and things. There's been a lot more that's been done there. And that's okay. There was, there was no expectation of maintaining that curve. That's not achievable. Okay. Uh, so it's been a good journey for us. We're still on that journey. And I'm more than happy to talk to you through the rest of the conference uh, about any questions you may have there. Feel free to reach out to me during the conference or on any of those things there and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.